everybody comes to this spot here, the first thing they do is reach out and adjust the microphone. I always watch for that. And 50% uh, of the time they get it wrong, but they carry on just the same. So if I've got it wrong and you can't hear me, tell me and I'll make a, another adjustment. Uh, I do like the, the portable one, that uh, then you can move around a little bit, but uh, this will be okay for today. I want to talk today on the subject which I've entitled, Putting Women in Their Place. I could, of course, use a different tone of voice and you may get a different connotation out of what I say. Something today that puts you all into a common denominator. You know that little mathematical term called a common denominator? I don't think we use it much these days because it's automatically done on a calculator for us anyhow. So we don't really have to worry about it much. But in the old days when you did real mathematics, you had to sometimes change um, um, fractions. And to change fractions, sometimes you had to find a common denominator. So you multiplied one by so much and whatever till you got a number that they both worked in together and then you'd work out the proportion, so much of this and so much of that, and you recorded it as a fraction. Today, I don't want you to think of fractions because it sounds more like factions, and we don't want any of that. So what I want to suggest to you today is we all have a common denominator, and some of you have already guessed what that is. You all came into this world via a mother. Whether you liked it or not, whether you are superstitious or not and talk about cabbages and all this kind of nonsense, the fact of the matter is you came into the world via a mother. Whether you liked your mother, whether you knew your mother, or whether your mother was the most loving person and the person who was most important in your life doesn't make any difference to the fact of the matter that you came into the world via a mother. So mothers are very important beings, aren't they? Very important beings. You know that, uh, as far as I know, anyway, there's no other beings that have to do with this world who have mothers. Angels come to this world in large numbers. And I guess if each one of us has a guardian angel, that means, hopefully, there's about another 100 and, uh, let me guess, 102 Angels around here, another 102 beings, but none of them, as far as I know, have mothers. So you're very privileged to have something that even the angels do not have. And so mothers are very important. But I want to suggest to you that mothers <coughs> sometimes are people who have not actually born a child of themselves. Because there are mothers who have nurtured children, nurtured infants from absolute infancy and have looked after them and brought them up, many of them God-fearing mothers and, uh, and others have brought them up with all the care and concern that a biological mother would care for a little one. So if you're in that category today, be included as a mother. And then there are others, of course, who have been mothers simply because they were motherly because they took on the role of a mother to someone perhaps in teen years or perhaps in younger years, perhaps even in adult years, they've taken on the role of mother to someone and uh, that individual sees this lady as their mother, one who has given them knowledge and information and nurture and comfort and peace of mind, one who has taken the utmost interest in their well-being. And we can find all those kind of mothers down through Scripture. So I want really to talk a little bit today about women in general. Because after all, all women, uh, <coughs> normally speaking, have potential to be mothers. Some are mothers almost. Some are mothers not yet. Some will be mothers in the future. And uh, <coughs> some, of course, are mothers of vast experience, having gone through their grandkids and even their great-grandkids. So the mother thing is very wide, very uh, widespread and very deep. I like to talk from Scripture. Let's go to the second uh, book of Timothy. Second book of Timothy. Now, Timothy 
is an interesting character. I always imagined Timothy to be quite a small person, but I don't know whether he really was. But in my mind, I try to draw a picture of all the Bible characters and Bible writers, and I suppose you do too. But uh, Timothy was someone who needed a bit of encouragement from the Apostle Paul, and Timothy was at his, uh, into his ministry when Paul was just about ready to finish his ministry. So Timothy was probably uh, being addressed by Paul around about 66 or 69 AD. That is something like 39, nearly 40 years after Jesus' time. And so Timothy, if he was a young man in his 20s, would probably have had a mother and would probably have a mother who was listening to Jesus. And his grandmother also seemed to be in that state. We want to look in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and reading verses 4 and 5. And uh, verse 4 is not so significant, but it sets the tone a bit. Greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance <coughs> the genuine faith that is in you which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I'm persuaded that it is also in you. So what is Paul really saying here? He's really commending two women who passed on a genuine faith to a son and grandson. These two women logically would have lived in the time of Jesus. His mother in particular would have, I'm sure, known of Jesus and heard of Jesus. But what's more, they received from Jesus a genuine faith and these women believed genuinely in the gospel message. And uh, Paul is giving them a commendation on the side for here were two women who took on the gospel message and made it real for themselves but somehow in the upbringing of their son and their grandson, they were able to transfer to him a genuineness of the gospel message. Paul was always interested in the genuineness of things. He mentioned it often. And here he's talking about the genuineness of the gospel message which was passed on from a grandmother to a mother. Now, whether he means the grandmother passed it to the mother of Timothy and she passed it on to Timothy... I'm not quite sure, but it almost reads as though the grandmother and the mother together worked in such a way and lived in such a way and believed in such a way that Timothy gained a very genuine concept of the gospel. And therefore, Paul has confidence that Timothy will be able to preach that gospel and maintain the sentiments of Jesus' gospel in his ministry. And uh, we're not going to read a lot more about uh, Timothy, except if we go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we probably need to turn a page, I think I do, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, we read his admonition to Timothy, but continue in the things which you have learned, and that you have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learnt them. Who did he learn these things from? Had Timothy learnt them from Jesus? It doesn't say that he had learnt them directly from Jesus. He had learnt them, we know, from his grandmother and from his mother. And then he goes on to say, Because from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So mothers and grandmothers can have great influence. They can bring to their children the confirmation of the gospel and instill into their hearts and minds the message of Jesus. If there is one thing that is most significant for women to do in the Christian church and in the Christian realm is to ensure that they present the gospel to the young people and to the children in a genuine, understandable form. I fear that down through the ages, there are many, many thousands of mothers and women who have this responsibility but have failed to do so. And I'm thinking of a couple that I know quite well who decided that they would 
not teach their children any spiritual stuff at all, but leave their children to grow up to make a choice for themselves. Whether they would be religious or whether they wouldn't, whether they would join a church or whether they wouldn't, whether they would be atheists or whether they would not. And uh, so I said to these folk, I said, if they don't know the options, don't know the, uh, the ins and outs of Christianity, how will they be able to make a choice when they're constantly bombarded with that which is not Christian? Which choice are they going to make? Do you want your children to be non-Christian? Because that's the only option you're giving them, even though you are claiming to give them the options. And unless you give them a Christian teaching, a Christian upbringing, and the Christian option, you are short-weighting your children and being unfair to them. These couple thought about this for a year or two, and then, uh, fortunately, they started showing up regularly in Sabbath school and uh, started teaching their children Christian principles, and the home changed to a good Christian home, and both those children today, as far as I am aware, are, are good living uh, Christian people. Well, for a moment, we perhaps should look back in history a little bit and think of some of the women who were so significant in biblical times. Eve, I suppose, is an easy start. And we don't know very much about her. She's only mentioned, I think, twice in Scripture. Eve, we know very little about. There are some religious groups that have condemned Eve to eternal damnation. And there's no place for her in the kingdom. But the Bible doesn't do that because the Bible takes Adam as being the head of the human race and deals with Adam and his descendants and the, the uh, uh, results of their sin. And Eve doesn't come into the question. But I believe that Eve was as repentant as Adam. And you show me a text in the scripture that tells otherwise. But then uh, Eve, of course, had sons who were brought up in the faith as it was known back then. The faith and confidence that Jesus, that God would send a saviour, and that would be Jesus Christ, who was not at that time named that way. But they knew that God was going to provide a substitute for them, and they would not have to die eternally because of their sin, but their sin would be forgiven and their repentance would be accepted. And uh, <clears throat> we don't know how many of the family accepted that, except we do know that, uh, <clears throat> that Cain made a big mistake in his understanding of it and was able to, at some stage to use his own self-will and turned against that which he knew. But then we can carry on. We could talk a lot about these people. There was Sarah and there was Rebecca. There was Rachel and Leah. Some of these names come close together. There was Miriam and there was Hagar. And what about Esther and Vashti? Very interesting scenarios in which we find them in Scripture. Two women in particular who had the same moral principles but two women who changed the course of history for the Jewish people. And uh, these people were movers and shakers in Judaism and uh, in, uh, <coughs> in the house of, of the Persian government. And both of them achieved uh, their objective. And uh, then there was Naomi and Ruth. And, of course, they go together. And the history of the Jewish people and, indeed, the result from that, bringing Jesus into that line uh, has, of course, been well uh, uh, understood and documented. Then there was Tamar, and there was Moses' mother, a very interesting person, no doubt, a woman who was able to outwit the king. But then, of course, there were the midwives of Egypt also who outwitted the king and his uh, commanders. And these midwives made a change in uh, Israel and saved Israel from annihilation. Then there was Anna, of course, the priestess, who, of course, is just in that transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Anna, the priestess, certainly she was a deacon, and we'll talk about that some other time. In fact, next uh, time I preach here, I think I will be preaching on the subject of... Uh, <coughs> of uh, the, 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 uh, the diaconi or diaconos 
and uh, that is to do with the deacon and the servant uh, situation in the church uh, then and now. And, uh, but however, some historical records tell us that in fact there were women priests in the temple serving in Judaism. Surprise to you, it was a surprise to me when I discovered it too. And uh, there was Anna there in the temple who uh, had waited for the Lord to come. There was Elizabeth and, of course, Mary. And then there's those New Testament names which we find commended in, uh, in Paul's closing remarks to the Romans in uh, chapter 16. He has a list of women there who were great helpers in the church. There was Phoebe, who is very significant, as mentioned twice in Scripture, and there are others, and, of course, we can think of those who held significant and important roles down through the ages, two of them uh, being judges, Holder and Deborah. We won't talk more about them, except for the fact that there is a common denominator, likewise, in this list of women and the others that we could put in here. And that common denominator is that each of them, in their time and in their place, changed the course of history. And you say that women were insignificant in biblical times. Not true at all. The Bible records that the significant changes in many instances for the Jewish people and for Christianity came about because women did something. And these women are significant in biblical times. And the percentage of women who made change in history is very substantial when you compare it with the number of incidences where men actually made changes in history. Because in many, many instances in Scripture, men followed one to another to another to another, and no significant change was made. Just look at the succession of kings in Israel, for instance, one after another after another. And the little commentaries that go with these kings, which say that uh, he did as his father before him, and uh, <clears throat> he did that which was wrong or evil in the sight of the Lord. They made no significant changes. There were some, of course, who did, and we're glad of them. It's interesting to <clears throat> note also that conservative religion has always put women in the background. Conservative religion has always put women in the background. Think about it for a while and you will uh, <coughs> uh, agree with me without me having to detail it all. They've always put women in the background, usually in the domestic scene, usually just into the domestic scene. Uh, just uh, a little note from a Jewish uh, philosopher, I suppose he was, and a writer. Um, Philo, his name was, lived around uh, 18... Uh, 1880 to uh, eight, no, uh, 80 BC to about 40, if I get it right, about 40 AD. So Philo was alive in the time of Christ. Remember that religion was very conservative in the time of Jesus. The Pharisees were stating the rules. We know all the extreme rules they had about the Sabbath. Well, we don't know all the rules because we can't remember them all. The 538 rules about the Sabbath, we can't remember them all. But in, collectively, we know there was a terrible conservatism about the role of women as well. <clears throat> Here is what Philo had to say, and he's commenting on how the conservative Jews should see their women. He says, marketplaces and council halls and law courts <coughs> and gatherings and meetings where a large number of people are assembled and open air life with full scope for discussion and action, all these things are suitable for men, both in wartime and in peace. But women are best suited to the indoor life, which never strays from the house within which the middle door is taken by the maidens as their boundary. That's the young girls. They can get to the middle door of the house, but not to the outside door. And the outer door by those who have reached full womanhood. Do you understand what this passage, this uh, fellow Philo is saying? He is saying the young girls should stay in the inner side of the house and not be seen. And the women who have reached full maturity, that's the mothers and the housewives, 
they should get to the door of the house, the outside door of the house, and that's it. In other words, women belong in the kitchen. That's the place for them. And so uh, this, of course, was part of the conservatism that was so strong in Jesus' time. No wonder Jesus had some things to say and to do with the, the women of his time, and no wonder he blessed the children and uh, because the children were taken by their mothers, which was a way of taking notice of the mothers without upsetting the hierarchy in the Jewish system. And uh, no wonder Jesus healed women, and no wonder Jesus took particular notice of women who were interested in his message because he realised how repressed they were. Phariseeism had in its uh, conservative customs no place for women at all except to be in the house and perhaps to produce a son and heir to carry their name on. It wasn't always this way. But you see, from around about 500, 400 years, around about the time of Malachi, about 400 years prior to Christ's coming, a very conservative movement took place in Judaism. And in their endeavour to wipe out idolatry, to wipe out sin, and to ensure that the commandments were kept so very exactly, the uh, Pharisees, the Jewish rulers and philosophers made up all these rules. And very much like Islam today, women were a pain to the morality of the men. And so the women were best kept uh, with their thumb down. The place for women was in the kitchen. But notice that Anna served in the temple around the time of Jesus. And as I mentioned, um, she is recorded by some early writers as early as 111 AD that she was actually a priest who served in the temple. So that be as it may, she at least was a deaconess, as we would call her today. And she served around the temple. She had broken through the barrier because of her devotion, because of her godliness. She had broken through the barrier of conservatism and she was noted for what she did for God and for the people. And uh, then, of course, uh, the temple was under the control of the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were liberal. Now, I'm su not suggesting that we should shilly-shally between being conservative and being liberal, but we should be balanced and we should be fair. And we should give people, the women in our society the place and role that God has assigned to them, not the place and role that we assign to them. And so the, the temple was controlled by the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't like the Pharisees, and so the Sadducees were much more liberal, and they saw roles for women that the Pharisees could never see. And so maybe that's how Anna came to be in the temple. Jesus indicated, as we see in Matthew 13 and verse 52, he indicated that some new ideas and systems would be rather radical to the old school thinkers. He said, there will, if you put new wine into old bottles, the old bottles won't take the new wine and they can't handle it and they burst. Jesus was hinting that the old conservatism of Judaism would not be able to receive his new and liberating views. And his new and liberating views would eventually destroy Judaism. And did that happen? That's exactly what happened. The new views of Christianity, which were liberating, destroyed, ultimately destroyed Judaism. And in the end, of course, we know that uh, the Romans came down and took over uh, the temple and so on. But the liberating views of Christianity, which gave people their just dues and rights, destroyed Christianity. It eventually destroyed paganism in those areas. The message of the gospel is the message that liberates people to live and to think and to do whatever they want in relation to Jesus Christ, in relation to their creator, in relation to their saviour. And so women, as they stand before Jesus Christ, are fully liberated from the taboos 
of, uh, of society and the taboos of conservative religion. When I talk about conservative religion, I also think about Buddhism and Islam and Shintoism and all those things who stick to a rigid, immovable line of philosophy, whereas Christianity opens the door to freedom, to growth, to advancement, to new light, to new wine that is not good to put in old bottles, and the old bottles can't take it, and so you have new bottles, and you have new vessels taking the new wine. New vessels, perhaps, in many cases, would be women guided by the Holy Spirit, doing what God wants them to do. You'll note that the gifts of the Spirit that we talk so much about are not, uh, uh, they are, in fact, gender neutral. It never says he or her. It never says him or her or men or women. It talks about a neutral scene. The gifts of the Spirit are given to those who believe. The gifts of the Spirit are given to those who are baptized into Jesus Christ. The gifts of the Spirit are given to all. The the gifts of the Spirit are the gift that God gives or Jesus passes on to those who serve and follow him. Is God's blessing Is God blessing women today with spiritual gifts? I suppose if we were to think about what women can do today and bring ourselves out of that uh, uh, early New Testament time to today, we would have to say there is evidence that God blesses women with spiritual gifts. Do they have the gifts of evangelism? Do they have the gift of welfare? Do they have the gift of teaching or of hospitality? Do they have the gift of administration? Do they have any other gift that is mentioned in those three particular passages of Scripture that talk about spiritual gifts? Do they have these gifts? We would have to say it is evident that they do. Adventist women of all women in the world ought to uh, be able to um, demonstrate that they have a spiritual gift. And I believe that they do. And I've left out one of those spiritual gifts, and that's the gift of preaching, because I recognise that some people will say, oh, 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 not that one. The spiritual gifts include preaching. And if they are neutral, gender neutral, then women also are included in the gift of preaching. I had a little quotation here, which I'll only take uh, uh, a moment on because our time runs away so fast. And if I can find the page that I wrote it on, it's, <coughs> it's here. Adventist women make an impact around the world. And uh, this is a report that came out in the record not so long ago. In the record, yeah, in the record. <coughs> a total of 1,555 evangelistic meetings and 14,826 other meetings were conducted by Adventist women in the recent year. As a result, 8,449 people were baptised and 18,091 were reclaimed for the church. In addition, 1,818 training seminars reached out to women in various ways. That is what the General Conference has recorded. And there's probably just as many um, (coughs) outreaches and evangelistic thrusts done by women that were never recorded. But they added to the church 18,091 members who had had backslidden and uh, they added 8,449 members to the church because of their outreach work. Would you say the Holy Spirit is working through a spiritual gift there? You would have to say that. uh, (coughs) There is work in various parts of the world, in Poland, in the Ukraine, in Moscow, um, even in Amman, in Jordan, of all places. You would think that that might be a difficult one. Women are working there, and uh, they are working there in a way that men can't work because they 
can go and talk to the women in their homes. And then in India, the same situation applies. Indian evangelists take women with them and women become the evangelist because they can talk to the women in their homes while the men talk about farming and talk about money and various other things outside. The women are the evangelists. And uh, Indonesia, we've heard somewhat about Indonesia, so uh, we don't need to talk about that. And there's Myanmar, that place that seems to be closed to the rest of the world. It used to be called Burma. Let me read this. A 22-year-old teacher, Amy, her name is, was part of a global mission project. She planned to go there and to work with children, which she did. And she prepared four students there for baptism in one village alone. And uh, it was feared that Amy's witnessing efforts would come to a halt, but Amy's sister took over from her when Amy died from malaria. Does the Holy Spirit work amongst women? Of course he does. And so there are others there that I could uh, mention as well, but I won't take the time. How sad it is that uh, from time to time we hear that women are put down when they are clearly called by God to be evangelistic. By being evangelistic, one can be a mother evangelizing in the home. A Christian mother who brings her children through to Christian and spiritual maturity has been the most effective evangelist of all because she is dealing with undeveloped minds. She is dealing with immature minds. And so the gospel has to be presented in the simplest and the, uh, should I say, the kindergarten form. And then as the children get older, she has to graduate herself to teach the children in the primary school form and then into the intermediate form and into the high school form. And so the mother who brings up her children in the <coughs> understanding of the gospel is the most universal evangelist of all. You know, I've been to evangelistic meetings. I've even helped in evangelistic meetings. And I hardly understood what the evangelist was on about. And I thought to myself, how on earth do these people understand what this guy's on about? And yet you go to a home and the mother is reading a Bible storybook to the children. Or some simple story about Esther. Or the story about Jesus and the children. Or the story about Jesus on the cross. In a simple kindergarten way. And those children are learning the gospel. Surely these mothers are evangelists. But I'll, tell, I'll just uh, <coughs> um, report this to you, which is rather sad. A lady, L.D. Campos, her name is, is a lady evangelist. This would only happen in America, of course. On occasion, at the end of a series of lectures, 60 people responded to her call for baptism. That's pretty good, isn't it? If you get 60 people that respond to your call for baptism... Any evangelist would be happy with that. But the elders, along with the pastor, decided that this was a rather risky thing to do because she, and I'm putting she in here, was a lady evangelist. And so they decided to postpone the baptisms for some time in the future, not knowing quite when, when a male evangelist could come and actually preach another series and make it genuine. That would be pretty disappointing if you're a lady evangelist. The evidence is there that she has 60 people ready for baptism. The evidence is there that the Holy Spirit has been working, that she has a spiritual gift of evangelism and of preaching. And the elders and the, <coughs> I presume the church board doesn't say, but at least, and the minister of all people said, this um, is not good enough. We're going to have to get a male evangelist to make sure that this, these people could be baptised. What a sad commentary on church. What a sad commentary on our attitudes, their attitudes, not ours, I hope, towards the working of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit's working is evidence in the calling of Christian woman, it's blasphemy to deny the fact 
and it is speaking a word against the Holy Spirit, using Jesus' words, to frustrate such activity. And Jesus said, that sin is one that will not be forgiven unto women, unto men. You know why? Jesus said it that way, because I think tongue-in-cheek he knew that men often made the decisions about how far women can go. Let me conclude by saying that all mothers are women. However, all God-fearing women will be mother to someone, somewhere, sometime, somehow. The influence of godly women is needed more today than ever. The gifts of the Spirit working in women will allow them to reach souls who would otherwise never be touched. Most godly mothers will never be city evangelists or big TV personalities or administrators or theologians, but they will be evangelists employed by God himself. They will teach in the family by precept and example, the way to live a godly life under the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These kind of women are the women who, like those of old, they make things happen. They make changes, changes that redirect the course of history and bring many souls to repentance, and the kingdom of heaven rejoices. What do you think of women? They're pretty good, aren't they? They're pretty good. And we want to see all women in the church as mothers in Israel. Let's close with uh, singing uh, our hymn. Blessed be the tie that binds. So you under Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that uh, there can be represented in the world today that which uh, you would desire of uh, humanity, and that is women who will give their hearts to you and that they will represent you in the sphere in which they live and work and have their being. We are thankful that uh, we can have confidence in Jesus Christ as our Saviour, 
And we pray that as we depart today, you will reinforce this message in our minds that we can look to him and we can be saved. We thank you for this again today. May we depart in peace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.